Professor Sachs, good evening. It's great to see you and have you on my show. Thanks so much for taking the time. I'm a huge fan, so I'm delighted to be with you. It's Thanks. mutual, uh, as I just said. So let me begin. I do want to talk about some of the issues involving the work that you've done in the past, some of the kind of uh, perceptions surrounding that work in just a little bit. But I want to first begin in Ukraine. We did our show on Ukraine last night, in particular what seems to be the never-ending increase in escalation. We now have a lot of more aggressive cross-border incursions by allied Ukrainian forces into Russia, along with Biden reversing himself yet again and saying he would send F-16 fighter jets after refusing. How do you assess the actual danger of escalation in terms of the possibility of some direct U.S.-Russia military conflict, even as an episodic misperception and ultimately the longer term risks of things like all out war between the West and Russia? Well, the risks are extremely high because we have a, a very determined Biden administration that wants to keep escalating. Russia is absolutely determined to prevent NATO from enlarging to Ukraine for understandable reasons, in my view. It's a 1,900-kilometer border of Ukraine, and Russia, and Russia does not want the U.S. military alliance on its border. And so as long as the Biden administration and the media that are absolutely supporting it and disguising the basic facts continue to push this NATO enlargement, we're going to have an escalating war. This war was completely avoidable. Uh, the party in this conflict that actually sought diplomacy repeatedly was Russia. Not something you'd read in the New York Times, actually, but the fact. Uh, and it was uh, Russia that put on the table on December 17th, uh, 2021, a draft U.S.-Russia security agreement to forestall the war. I actually called the White House uh, soon afterwards. I said, you've got the basis to negotiate, avoid this war. And I was told, no, we're not going to discuss NATO enlargement. That's our business. It's not Russia's business. And I said, are you kidding? This is going to cause a massive and very dangerous war. No, this is our policy and so forth. I, you know, you could ask the question, how, if they did a little thought experiment, uh, how would the Biden administration think about Russia establishing military bases in Mexico? Eh, probably not thrilled. They probably wouldn't say, well, that's Mexico's choice. What are we going to do about it? So a little bit of thinking and empathy might have gone a long way. Uh, but we have heard almost nothing about it in, in, in your expertise, which I'm just amazed at day by day how the New York Times and other mainstream media twist all of this. I recently uh, asked an assistant of mine, please uh, do a scan for the last two years of the editorial pages of the New York Times 26 times the idea of unprovoked invasion has been raised by the New York Times in its editorials, in its opinion, columns of the New York Times columnists like Tom Friedman and others, and in the invited op-eds. And you just can't get a word in. Otherwise, you can't tell that readership you were just describing in Manhattan, where I happen to live, what's really going on. So th this is the frightening part. And we're also told, Glenn, which is pretty damn weird, don't worry about nuclear escalation. Don't be blackmailed by this. My advice is worry and worry a lot. And if you have uh, been around these issues for a while, and I have for decades, and I wrote a book about the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis and Kennedy's uh, successful quest to negotiate a partial nuclear test ban treaty with Nikita Khrushchev, you know, if you're not worried, you just don't get it because you better be worried. And I'm very worried about this administration not getting it. You know, it's, it was such a staple of Cold War culture, Cold War policy, 
that avoiding nuclear war was the single greatest priority as we were going around the world with these proxy conflicts against the Soviet Union. We managed never to directly engage them militarily. And even then, misperception, miscommunication did bring the world close to nuclear annihilation, at least on two occasions, between the Soviet Union and the United States. And yet it really does amaze me that we seem to have just kind of through, I don't know, inertia or lethargy or historical ignorance come to view the risk of nuclear war as basically a fiction, as kind of assigning zero value to it, or even this kind of macho attitude that we're not going to be deterred by the country, a country having nuclear weapons. Talk a little bit about, you know, in the time that you've been working in all the things that I discussed in these kind of geopolitical uh, framework, even from an economics perspective, the specter of nuclear war and how it used to be kind of important for people and policymakers in deciding what they would and wouldn't do. You know, there was one moment when uh, Biden was caught on tape saying, uh, you know, we're on a path to Armageddon. Uh, this is, uh, I think it was the fall of uh, 2022. 2021, if I remember. No, 2022. Or, or 2022. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, 2022, excuse me. Uh, and you know, he was excoriated by the press the next day <laughs> rather than anybody reflecting, oh, my God, the president of the United States is saying this. He was excoriated. How dare he say this? You know, he let a tiny glimmer of the truth in. And then, of course, the whole idea was shut that up. Don't talk about that. Well, anyone that knows some history, and by the way, if you want to know some history, the most wonderful book written about this by a great historian is a book called Gambling with Armageddon by a late great historian, Martin Sherwin, who wrote about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the whole atomic age, in fact. And the book is terrifying because we came so close 60 years ago, uh, actually 61 years ago now, to nuclear annihilation. And almost every one of Kennedy's aides would have pushed us to that. We fortunately had uh, a president who uh, had the sense uh, to avoid uh, the ultimate disaster, but almost none of his aides had that sense. And what Sherwin recalls and what we've learned from Dan Ellsberg and from so many others is how close we've come and how easy it is to come close because there are so many stupid people in our government, believe me. This is something I can tell you, absolutely. People who don't think, who are extraordinarily lacking in basic common sense, who believe that power is the only coin of the realm, uh, who uh, believe you really do have to be tough on whatever it is, and nuclear war will see them down. And uh, all of this is uh, extraordinarily reckless, and we're really in it now. And it's, of course, not just Ukraine. It's Nancy Pelosi flying to Taiwan. Uh, it's uh, us doing whatever we can to humiliate China. It's having an absurd G7 meeting last week in Hiroshima, of all place, places uh, that the U.S., of course, uh, bombed with the first nuclear uh, atomic bomb, uh, spending the whole G7, in essence, to attack China and Russia. The they think it maybe they think it plays politics. They think it's a game. It's extraordinarily reckless and extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily predictable what's going on. Yeah. Because the, the, the real diplomats inside the U.S. have been warning about this for decades. We're only finding some of it out by WikiLeaks and by. Uh, by disclosures such as uh, Bill Burns, their CIA director, who was in 2008 the U.S. ambassador to Russia, and he sent a memo that everybody should read. To Condoleezza in 2008, Rice. Yeah, he explained, my God, this NATO enlargement business is absolutely dangerous. And, of course, George Kennan a decade earlier, and George Kennan was absolutely brilliant and understood 
already in the 50s how we could have gotten out of the Cold War. But certainly in 1997, he wrote an op-ed in, in the New York Times when they still ran such op-eds uh, <laughs> that uh, this whole NATO enlargement business was absolutely reckless. And what's interesting, when Kennan was writing that 1997, I hadn't actually realized it until I went back and saw a reference to uh, an article in Foreign Affairs by Zvig Brzezinski that I didn't remember, writing in 1997, laying out almost the precise timetable for how we were going to incorporate Ukraine into NATO. Now, this is years before Putin's president. This is when we're not having any uh, war with Russia. People tell me, oh, yeah, well, they have to be in NATO. Look at Putin, uh, you know, madman. But this is well before, and Brzezinski lays out basically to the year the sequence of how it's going to be the first uh, row of countries, which was Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, then it's going to be the next row, then Ukraine by 2005 to 2010, he writes, they're going to have their invitation. It turned out to be 2008. Our ambassador to NATO in 2008 was none other than Victoria Nuland. If you want to know what deep state means, she's been in every administration she's been Almost every night. Except Trump. when Trump but was elected. Was, That's the only exactly. way, apparently, to get her out of the government. <laughs> Except Trump. Yeah. So she was Cheney's advisor. She was ambassador to NATO when we asked Ukraine to come in. She was the point person on the U.S. engagement in the violent overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014, which started the war in Ukraine. And she is now promoted for all of this, uh, bringing us ever closer to disaster. And by the way, putting Ukraine in the classic place in a proxy war guaranteed to destroy that country, which is exactly what it's doing. You know, the thing that struck me so much about that Bill Burns memo in 2008 when he was warning Condoleezza Rice and others in the Bush administration about the insanity of this plan was he said, it isn't just Putin. You go and talk to every single person of influence in Moscow, even Putin's liberal critics, and it's all for every last one of them a huge red line to be mucking around in Ukraine for the West, in part because of the history of the 20th century. And that's what I wanted to ask you. You gave this interview in February of 2023 with Isaac Chadner of The New Yorker, who has been kind of come this hero to the liberal establishment because of these adversarial interviews he purportedly does. A lot of it is based on how transcripts get edited, how much he gets to say, how much the guest gets to say. I've done a couple of those with him, so I know firsthand. Um, one of the points what a you low would... life appro what a low life approach to journalism. Uh, uh, completely, completely. I mean, it, it, it. I mean, I, my, my night failed. Ended up being pretty fair, but I've seen him done incredible hatchet jobs with others, including yours. Because one of the points you kept trying to make was that the premises of his questions embedded in them, they were almost like, when did you stop beating your wife questions, were so misguided because he was distorting the history of the conflict, in part by thinking the war began either in 2022 or even in 2014 with Crimea, and you kept pointing it out, actually, the start of the war is 2013 with this change of government that he was shocked you called a coup, or even before with NATO expansion, even before it got to Ukraine. So talk about those parts of the history that the New York Times, the New York, the New Yorker editors didn't allow you to have included in that article and why you think that history is so important to understanding how we're being propagandized about the conflict now. Well, it's, it's a, a little amazing to be the New Yorker of all places. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say of all places, but Remnick's New Yorker is, uh, is absolutely neocon beginning to end. The New York Times is uh, completely neocon. I don't know if they would be, by the way. If I, I can't figure it out if it's just anti-Trump, pro-Biden, or they really believe the stuff that they say. But they're absolutely unwilling to listen or to learn a fact. The thing that surprised me about Chotner was just how he knew nothing and kept making aggressive assertions. And when you tried to say something, it was just snark. So it was a really weird 
<laughs> Weird experience. Well, explain to that audience that, that loves it. Like, you know, they assume all of his assumptions that he's getting from the New York Times. That's the full extent of their worldview. You kept trying to inject an alternative historical understanding, but it never made it into the article, which is why I'd love for you to offer it now about the importance of 2013 and that change of government. And even kind of going back to when NATO started expanding after the reunification of Germany eastward toward the Soviet or toward Russia. Well, you know, I, I posted a piece on common dreams, which people can take a look at to get a lot of the hyperlinks and a lot of the underlying data and evidence. But this story really goes back 34 years. Uh, it goes back to 1989, 1990. Uh, the U.S. was and Germany were both very clear to Gorbachev, who was a godsend for the world, by the way because he really was a man of peace. And I was profoundly honored to try to help uh, him uh, in, on the economic side, though the White House was having none of it at the time. But in any event, Gorbachev believed in peace and he unilaterally disbanded the Warsaw Pact, which was the, the Soviet side NATO. And uh, uh, Baker, uh, and uh, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, the German foreign minister, repeated <laughs> time and again to Gorbachev and in many, many different forms, and so did the NATO secretary general and others, we will not move NATO one inch eastward. We won't do it. Now, I spoke to a wonderful historian uh, who is working on this right now who tells me that in the archives he's come across in 1992, not only the plans for NATO expansion, but Ukraine already on the list for NATO expansion in 1992, when supposedly in the public, there is no such thing as NATO expansion at all. But remember 1992, that was Cheney, Wolfowitz uh, and Rumsfeld in, in, uh, in, the, in the Bush senior administration, I thought, what could be worse? Well, we kept learning. <laughs> Things can get worse. <laughs> right, right. Uh, if, 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 and, 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 and in the Democratic Party, the, 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 the love affair with the so-called liberal hegemony, I don't know what the liberal part is, but I know what the hegemony part is, uh, that has been Newland's uh, thing, and of course her husband uh, Robert Kagan's thing uh, for decades. This has been underway since the early 1990s. 90s. Now, the Russians have been saying, and Gorbachev said, don't move eastward. We want peace. We want openness. I was actually advisor to Gorbachev. I was economic advisor to Yeltsin. I was economic advisor to Leonid Kuchma, first president of independent Ukraine. I've seen all of these people. You know what they wanted? They wanted normal life. They wanted to stop the Cold War. They did not want crazy things. They wanted normalcy. And we wouldn't give it what we said. Normalcy, yeah, that's U.S. hegemony. That's U.S. indispensable power. That's U.S. we do what we want anywhere we want when we want it. And that has been the story all along. And frankly, I couldn't imagine it at the time because I was watching with my own eyes as a young guy. Suddenly, the world had a chance for peace. And peace didn't mean U.S. global hegemony. Peace meant normal cooperation. But we couldn't accept the deal of just being normal and cooperative. We had to say, now we lead on everything. And that's been the story since the beginning. Now, there are many steps to it. Uh, Clinton was the, the first violator of the, the promises, and Clinton's so inconsistent on everything, but this is one of the things he was inconsistent on. Uh, so the first NATO expansion took place under Clinton, uh, and uh, that was uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. The next NATO expansion, seven countries by Bush Jr. in 2004, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Romania and Bulgaria on the Black Sea. So you had the Baltic states, you had Romania and Bulgaria, you're starting to, you know, right up against Russia, uh, Slovakia and Slovenia. Now, Putin says in 2007, stop already, stop. He says it in a 
famous speech uh, at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. We don't listen at all. 2008, Bush says NATO is going to enlarge to Ukraine. The European leaders, by the way, were aghast. And the, one of the European top leaders at the time called me, said, what is your president doing? Of course, European leaders don't say any of this publicly, but they say privately, this is crazy. This is so dangerous. But of course, they were quiet. Bush pushed this through in 2008. Then there was a reprieve for Ukraine. The reprieve was that the president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, said, look, we're in between two giants. We don't want to be smashed in the middle. We take neutrality. But neutrality was a red flag for Victoria Nuland and, uh, and her friends. And so at the end of 2013, when demonstrations against the decision that Yanukovych had made to postpone signing an agreement with EU started protests. Believe me, the U.S. covertly and overtly and every other way stirred that up massively. But in January and February 2014, they supported a violent insurrection that overthrew Yanukovych. And of course, notoriously, Newland was caught on tape, something we don't talk about, but Anyone go listen she to it. She picked the she's, next leader. She picked the new leader. She, she, she's planning the government weeks before the overthrow, calling exactly who would be the prime minister, by the way. It's amazing. But the whole thing is amnesia. Don't talk about any of this, So though it's so obvious. And I had a weird experience personally, which was that when the government was overthrown and Yanukovych fled and Yatsenuk was prime minister, just as uh, Newland said, I got a call. Yatsenuk wants to meet you. It's a deep economic crisis. Okay, you know, I actually respond to those things when a government says we're in a very deep financial crisis. So I flew to Kiev and I, I had an NGO brag to me about the role they played in the overthrow. And it was ugly. It left me shaking. It was, you know, the kind of thing you just want to wash that off. Don't tell me this awful stuff. You had no business being part of a violent insurrection. But that's the role we played. I went home. I didn't go back. I was disgusted by the whole thing. But it was obvious then. We were on a path towards war. This didn't start with a, quote, unprovoked invasion February 24th, 2000. Uh, 22, uh, 21, sorry. Uh, no, 22, excuse me. Uh, this started in February 2014. And it started with the U.S. participation in a coup. Now, one thing I can tell you, Glenn, uh, you know, I've been in international, in international finance and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, working never with the U.S. government, always with basically poor countries and trying to help them. I've seen so much now of the U.S. destabilization of other countries. It's disgusting and it's just not covered. And by the way, just to give you another journalistic, you know, weirdness, uh, I was friendly with uh, Aristide in Haiti. I liked him. Uh, I wanted to help him. He said to me, Jeff, they're going to get me. I thought, oh, come on. No, they're not going to get you. I'm going to help you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It's going to be fine. No, no, they're going to get me. And uh, OK, I didn't get it. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, Bush stopped all World Bank loans, IMF loans, inter, uh, inter-American Development Bank loans. They used the usual financial squeeze to break him. But he remained there and he remained popular. So they eventually threw him out in a coup and they landed a plane with an unmarked tail and they stuck him in the plane and they flew him to Central Africa. OK, I knew a bit about what was going on and I called the New York Times reporter. I said, there's a coup in broad daylight. Would you cover this? And you know what I was told? The editor is not interested in that. 
a coup in broad daylight and the editors not interested in covering that. That's actually how it went down. And then I testified in Congress a few days later to a committee where everyone swore how much they loved Haiti. And boy, it was so good that that the Aristide was taken out of harm's way that the United States saved him, <laughs> saved him uh -huh. by flying him out. You know, you can say anything in this country right now. Or, I mean, our government can say anything in this country that six people in a in a yacht or a rowboat blew up Nord Stream. You say anything. And the New York Times sucks its thumb and says, yeah, that's what an unofficial senior senior official said, uh, unnamed senior official in the United States government said. And that that seems right. And that's how we are right now. No one's no one's talking. No one's thinking. <laughs> Let, so let, the way, let, I want to ask you about that. I want to, I want to ask you about that, that that specific media part. Before I do, let me just on the substance of Ukraine. A lot of times people say, "I don't understand what they're really trying to do is make some rhetorical point about something not making sense." That's not the way in which I mean this. I genuinely don't understand the following: neocons obviously yeah. were kind of catapulted into a position of power in Washington after 9/11. All their dreams, invading Iraq and having regime change plans for the broader Middle East were all being empowered. And with the disaster that they ushered in that everybody recognized, the foreign policy community kind of said, all right, we're done with these crazy people for a while. The second term of the Bush administration kind of reined them in. Obviously, Obama was elected on a promise to reject neoconservatism. And for a long time in Washington, it wasn't just people, you know, like you or like Noam Chomsky, but I mean like very uh, sort of middle of the road, centrist, mainstream people like Bill Burns, like President Obama, like Donald Trump, whose view was Ukraine is not a vital interest to the United States. That vital interest doctrine always being central to how we formulated our foreign policy, what we were and not willing to go to war for. That it's always going to be a vital interest to Russia, but not to Ukraine. That was what Obama eloquently argued. That was what Trump also argued in his own kind of Trumpian way. Biden was part of that Obama administration that was clearly the position of, of the Biden administration, of the, of the Obama administration. Now here we are, to the extent that I could discern any interest that we might have had in provoking the Russians into that war, it was accomplished in the first week or two when we got the Europeans to disassociate themselves from Nord Stream and start buying our own natural gas. That was mission accomplished. And yet here we are a year and two months later, a year and three months later, there's clearly no attempt, none, on the part of the U.S. government to try and negotiate a peace deal. In fact, they block them when they emerge. And we seem to be getting deeper and deeper and deeper involved into this war, which at the end of the day is about nothing more than who will rule certain provinces in eastern Ukraine or what will be their status. What? changed in Washington that has made bipartisan Washington, not just neocons, but the vast majority of the establishment wings of both party and the Biden administration, so committed to this war, with seemingly with no end in sight. Yeah, Glenn, it, I think the, the part that uh, can, can help on this is that the neocon part never went away, and it was core to the Obama administration. It, it wasn't foreign to the Obama administration. And let me just illustrate, nothing was really reined in. Remember, 2008, the last year of Bush Jr., was when the commitment of NATO made at the Bucharest NATO summit that NATO would enlarge to Ukraine and Georgia, by the way, was made. So nothing was reined in at the end of the Bush administration. People should look on a map, by the way, Georgia, and not Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia and the Caucasus. What's Georgia doing there, for, for heaven's sake? Well, if you look at the map, the, the plan is to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia surrounds Russia in the Black Sea. That's the idea. So that was there consistently from the early 1990s, big Brzezinski explained it in 1997. It continued to be U.S. policy in 2008. Then comes uh, the Obama administration, but Obama supports lots of war, and this is That's for sure. not well understood. But it's it's not well understood yet. Hillary, of course, who I don't know if she ever saw a conflict she didn't want to get 
more deeply into. But for example, Syria. It's never been explained to the American people. Syria was not a civil war. Syria was a U.S. CIA-led regime change operation that went terribly wrong. And we actually, in our mainstream press, say, Russia came into Syria. How dare they do that? We were in Syria in 2011 with CIA to overthrow Assad. I happen to know, again, because of my role in diplomatic circles, that in 2012, there was an agreement to end the fighting in Syria, but it was blocked by one party. You know who that was? That was the United States. I was going to guess. Everyone else, everyone else agreed to a framework that was being put together by the highest diplomacy. The U.S. blocked it. <clears throat> the mediator talked to me at one point. Jeff, you cannot believe it. It's one government. It's the U.S. which insists Assad must go the first day. Everyone else wanted to do something pragmatic to stop the fighting. The fighting ended up going on many years. At the end of that year in 2011, there's NATO bombing and ending up, uh, you know, driving uh, to his death and creating another decade of civil, of real uh, civil war and outside war, Libya, uh, killing Muammar Gaddafi. It was the Obama administration, Victoria Nuland as Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs in February 2014 that participates in the violent overthrow of Yanukovych. So Obama, you know, he, he had some important good sense in 2014 said, I don't want to get more deeply into it, but it was his administration that played the role that triggered this thing. And how much analysis have we had from the New York Times? Let me come back to my favorite newspaper over uh, my lifetime. Nothing, no word about any of this, how this really played out. So the odd part is Trump, it, it, it stops in, in this weird way. I, I don't even know what those years meant exactly. It's so weird. Uh, but there were no new wars. Biden comes in, and it's important to understand, you know, in 2014, when Newland is caught on the tape, what does she say? How's this deal going to close? She says, I got, by, I got the VP waiting. And she's talking about Jake and the VP. So the team, which is Biden, Sullivan, and Newland, they each had one rung lower on their jobs in 2014. You had a vice president. Jake Sullivan had the same job as national security advisor to Biden, but Biden was vice president, not president. And Newland was assistant secretary, not undersecretary, but it's the same group. So the underlying continuity is, is the main point. And really something I've, you know, basically learned over time because I, I didn't get it. These ideas and plans actually go back 30 years. That's weird. But you know, when a historian tells you, oh, no, 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 Ukraine's already on the list in 1992. And you have uh, in the wonderful uh, memoirs of Bill Perry, written, I think, 2017, 2016, 2017, when he says, I thought about resigning from the Clinton administration because I really oppose the, the NATO enlargement. That's all the stuff that, you know, we're just not brought into, except after the fact. This is not democratic deliberation. This is uh, you try to somehow parse these details and you get snippets of it or you happen to be in circles that someone explains something to you or you see something or you hear something, but you can't figure it out from what anyone is saying on the surface because this stuff is not for the American people to understand. They're just supposed to understand that in February 24th, 2022, there was an unprovoked war by a crazy megalomania. The new That's Hitler. The, only the new Hitler. But so so he, 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 here's the, so this really does lead into the media component. And I just want to ask you about that because I also want to talk about COVID without taking up all of your time tonight. Um, but we played 
a video of you uh, last night, actually, with Robert uh, Wright, where you were essentially expressing shock that the media has become such an arm of the U.S. security state that they're even willing to say things that are laughable on its face, like trying to convince us that Russia blew up its own pipeline, just like they wanted to convince us that Russia drone bombed the Kremlin. You know, everything's a false flag when Russia does it, but you can never suggest the U.S. did anything as a false flag, or you immediately get relegated to the, to the uh, sector of, of being a crazy conspiracy theorist. My the, a main reason why I started writing about politics in 2005 was because I had perceived the corporate media was way too subservient and deferential to the narratives of the U.S. security state when it came to the war on terror. That was a big criticism of mine from the start. It's gotten so much worse now. In 2004, the New York Times came out with a pretty historically significant mea culpa saying, hey, we know we helped sell that war in Iraq, and it was because we were too uncritical about what the security state was telling us, and we're never going to make that mistake again. They're in another universe now in terms of their willingness to write down whatever the CIA tells them to say, even when they know it's false. And I want to understand why my hypothesis is that Trump really did change everything. His election made a lot of people in elite media circles believe that we were facing this kind of singular threat, this new Hitler. I think they talked themselves into that, and that anything and everything became justified in the name of stopping Trump and his movement because nothing is more dangerous. And they saw correctly the CIA, the FBI, the U.S. security state as allies in the war against Trump because they perceived Trump as very valuable. That's where Rushgate come from. And they, in that alliance, became so deferential, way more so than ever, that they're willing to say almost anything. And yet here you have you know, a very serious war by all accounts, no matter where you fall on, on the side of it. And I don't even think Iraq was as drowning in propaganda as the war in Ukraine is. It's not just propaganda. It's just completely false narratives to the point where they say laughable things like that pipeline example. I know these questions of why did this institution get corrupted? Why are they like this is always hard? You're talking about a lot of people. There's probably mixed motives. But what is your view about why these media outlets, almost to the point where you can ask a lot of people inside of them who will admit that it's happened, become completely abdicating in terms of their supposed core mission of being adversarial to these agencies? <laughs> That's why I listen to you to try to understand this, because it's not, it's, it's not a grown-up thing. And uh, I, I had the strange experience just after Nord Stream was blown up that I ran into a, a classmate and friend and someone I really like, a top journalist in, in the U.S. Okay, a New York Times journalist, because I've mentioned it. I don't want to mention his name, but a, a friend. Uh, and uh, I said, hey, you know, I, I think the U.S. did this. Uh, and he said to me, of course the U.S. did this. Who else? And I said, yeah, but your paper said this morning it was Russia. He said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, come on, this is serious stuff. And uh, he batted it off again. And I said, you know, it's really serious. And when you and I were at school together decades ago, uh, we had the Pentagon Papers. We had uh, Watergate. I lived on the New York Times every day, you know, uh, loving it. That's how I grew up. And he said to me, that paper is so dead and gone. I wish it's so depressing to hear that from one of the leading journalists, uh, because this, this guy's a very talented guy. But the fact of the matter is they would not cover this Nord Stream story until today. And, you know, the, the joke of it was when Cy Hirsch uh, made his piece and perfectly sensible, explained a lot. And by the way, explained that this madcap thing of blowing up the pipeline was so stupid and so reckless that top intelligence people turned to Hirsch because they thought this is crazy what the White House is doing. So that even that is perfect. And there's sensible. no other way anymore the, to get their 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 dissent yeah. out. No one will print the it. The New York Times, the New York Times would not even mention Cy Hirsch's story. And then, of course, it was, I don't know, uh, months later that they had some absolutely <laughs> absurd uh, it wasn't even a 12-hour news cycle of a few people in a boat. And, you know, a, a few people in a boat that couldn't even have an anchor when the water is 270 feet deep. 
So the whole thing is so completely absurd, but they played that story. But I think, you know, one of the things, Glenn, that impresses me about all of this is it doesn't really fool many people. It's not like this is believed. The, the confidence of the media is rock bottom. It just gives something to avoid talking in some way. It's not that they say, God, we really got them now. They really believe this absurdity. And, and today, I think it was today uh, uh, you had uh, um, Roddick Sikorsky who tweeted uh, just after the Nord Stream was blown up, thank you, USA. And he's walking through an airport and a reporter shouts out to him, hey, why did you tweet thank you, USA, you know, with the picture of the pipeline? And he smiles and they call again and he smiles because the truth is they don't need to discuss this. This is just arrogance. They don't, what do they have to They're talk laughing to at their to ability to this? deceive the public. They're, they're laughing at the fact that they can simultaneously admit it and then continue to deny it. You know, Ted yeah, Cruz exactly. was openly giggling with Victoria Nuland at a Senate hearing about how happy they were that this is now a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea, right. which Biden and Nuland explicitly threatened that they were going to do this multiple times. And I do think on some level, part of the power that they enjoy is their ability to sell the most preposterous stories because they don't even have to be bothered with trying any longer to answer to anybody because the media will never insist that they do. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether anyone believes it or not. So they're not even trying to sell clever stories. <laughs> they're just selling stupid things or smiling. We don't have to answer anything. But how is it, and I need to ask you, in, in the White House newsroom, how come there isn't somebody there that's calling out real questions? Is it just that they don't get called on or that to be in, in the pen or whatever it is, the pool, I, sh I should say, uh, that uh, y y you don't stay there if you actually want to find out something? Yeah, I think, I think a big part is, I you know, I, one of the things that really struck me is during Russiagate, when I was questioning a lot of those original stories and a lot of the stories overall, I was getting lots of uh, messages from journalists inside every single one of these major newspapers and major digital outlets saying, thank you so much for what you're, you were doing. And it was so striking that they weren't doing it, even though they had the platforms to do it. And I think the reason is this kind of this media industry, except for independent media now, is collapsing. And if you step out of line, if you're one of the people who ask an off key note, all the people in that room who may someday be the people who have to evaluate whether you get the one open spot at a new network at a new network. And if Twitter one time calls you a Russian agent or makes fun of you or mocks you, it's an easy way to throw away your resume, there is no more space within corporate journalism for that kind of individuality, for that kind of difficult personality. Conformity is what fuels the advancement of careers. And I think that kind of herd mentality is a big part of it. Let me, let me just move on to, to COVID. Um, I could talk to you all night. I'm going to force you to come back on my show. So we, we're going to have time Go to talk about other things, <laughs> even though we run out of time now. Um, at the beginning of the, the pandemic, as we now know, because of emails we've seen uh, from Dr. Fauci, some of the world's leading epidemiologists and virologists were writing to him saying, look, there's just, ext it's extremely unlikely. This was naturally evolving. This almost definitely came from a lab leak based on DNA analysis and all sorts of other claims. And within three weeks, some of those very same people became part of the consensus, signing the Lancet letter, saying that only crazy conspiracy theorists think that this was a lab leak, something that three weeks ago they were telling him in private they thought they were almost certain of. You have now become somebody, despite having been chosen at first to be this head of the Lancet task force on COVID, who has openly said, we don't know the answer, but it's clearly plausible that it might have come from a lab leak. And you have even suggested it may not even come from a Chinese lab leak, but from a US lab leak. Have you, has your views on that question evolved over time? And what is your rationale for thinking it may have come from an American facility? Yeah, I, well, I learned a lot in the process of being a chairman of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. So when, uh, when I was asked, uh, I, I have uh, a fair amount of experience in public health. Uh, I, helped to organize originally the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and had chaired a commission uh, for WHO and had worked on 
uh, epidemic diseases. So I was very familiar with the, with the community. And I was friends with Fauci, by the way, uh, going back uh, to uh, uh, 2000, 2000, 2001. Uh, I wrote him a memo why we needed a, a plan that eventually became PEPFAR, even with the number that I gave right at the beginning that we need a $3 billion a year plan. And I went to brief him and Condi Rice and so forth uh, in, in the first weeks of the Bush administration. So, OK, I, I was very uh, 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 honored to take on the assignment of chair of the commission. And I listened around and I thought, well, the, the scientists have said uh, in an article in Nature Medicine in March uh, 20, uh, 2020, uh, that uh, this was natural. Basically, they said irrefutably, so uh, essentially. And I thought that was plausible because that's what pandemics are. They are zoonoses. That, that means they go from animals to humans, and that's what SARS was, and on and on. So I actually <laughs> I, I hired the guy. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I didn't hire him. There was no money involved, but I asked Peter Daszak uh, of Eco Health Alliance, which is in the center of the, uh, in, in the, the center villain of, of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, for a uh, lot yeah, of people. All yeah. of this. I, I said, uh, Peter, why don't you be uh, chair of our task force, not of the commission, but of the task force working on the origin of this virus? Because you know a lot about it. You know what's going on in China. You know about bat, bat viruses and so forth. Okay, that's stepping into it. So I did. <laughs> I stepped in. I, I stepped into it and. Um, and we started, and I started to get a bit of hate mail uh, towards the end of 2020, which is not so unusual. Uh, but, you know, Sachs, why did you put this guy in and a Republican congressman? This is uh, disgraceful. And I wrote back saying, look, I'm completely open minded and I've given the assignment to them. Find out the truth of what this is. And if it's from a lab, we're going to and if it's possible, we're going to track that down. And believe me, he doesn't make the judgment. There are 28 commissioners. I'm in charge of this and so forth. OK, so you start seeing because of the relentless work of this organization you started, The Intercept and U.S. Right to Know, we start getting strange things coming out, uh, which is uh, but it took a long time just to get those first FOIAs uh, coming out. And things start uh, dropping that are a little weird. And then I got a wonderful briefing by a top uh, scientist who explained to me, Jeff, it's, uh, you know, it's not what is being said. Let me explain to you the research that was going on. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, he explained gain-of-function research to me for the first time in two or three hours of pretty detailed technical work. And he said, go read the NIH proposals. So I went online afterwards and I read that aim one is to test these uh, chimeric viruses in the following way. And, oh, shit, we got, I got to figure out what's going on. So I went to Dashik the next day and I said, Peter, I need to see your full research proposal. And his line to me was, uh, no, my lawyers say I can't share that with you. I said, are you kidding? We're in a... We're in a commission that is a transparent public commission. No, no, no. My lawyer said the I can't most share significant that with you. I said, okay. pandemic in, in yes. almost a, a century. So, I, so I, I said, I said, you're off the, you know, you're off the task force. Forget it. We're not going to have that. But all of that's a long way to say things started to be peeled back in a most remarkable way. I give huge, huge credit to the Intercept yep. and to U.S. Right to Know and to a whistleblower who posted the decisive document, uh, which is the DARPA Diffuse research proposal that was posted by a whistleblower that is almost a cookbook, how to make a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Well, this became rather a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing because the more we knew, the more we could see that what those scientists had written was phony. That's first of all. Second, that Fauci had been lying. That was absolutely clear. And third, I have to correct you, Glenn, it wasn't three weeks. It was three days after the February 1 
conference call where they said, I can't figure out how this could have come out of nature. Right, right. Three days later, that they have the first draft of a paper that's called Proximal Origins of SARS-CoV-2, which is the one that says it's definitely natural. And you know what? And then anyone who thinks otherwise is a malicious disinformation agent and conspiracy theorist. Right. And and by the way, so the bottom line, this is a long story. It's absolutely fascinating. But the the bottom line is the following. First, there's a, a weird part of this virus called a furin cleavage site. It's four amino acids, which make the virus highly infectious and deadly. Second, that was a target of known research. Third, it was the target of the DARPA diffuse project. Fourth, it was a major target of University of North Carolina in partnership with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It's obvious there's something to explain here. Maybe it's a weird coincidence. Maybe, and I think more than likely, it's part of the research gone awry. But not only did Fauci hide this and also the public, as usual, didn't learn that already in the spring of 2020, the Department of Energy, because it's Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, had and uh, Department of Energy was one and uh, another. The FBI. Had already, found, had already found that there was a good chance that this was coming out of a lab and right. no, one was, no one was telling us anything. I'm, I'm getting a bad echo uh, right now, Glenn. Oh, um, we're gonna we're gonna try and 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 fix that right now. Um, yeah, so they're they're gonna work that. But I just want to say, but, you, uh, go ahead. But, I just want, Glenn, no, I, 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 just to, go ahead. You fin- go. You, you finish your answer. You finish first. Just to give you the bottom line, to this day, no Democrat in Congress will touch this. It's the weirdest thing. The Republicans say we need to investigate. I was just with Senator Rand Paul. He's done a, a great job of saying we need to find out what this is. He can't get Democrats on this because protecting Fauci or protecting by I don't know what they think they're doing. How the heck did the origin of SARS-CoV-2 become a partisan issue? That is so weird, so strange, so unpleasant. And yet that's how our politics has basically disintegrated. It's bizarre. Even, even even totally what should be totally political questions, like a scientific question about the origin of the most significant pandemic in a hundred years, whether we played a role with good intentions or otherwise in causing it to happen is something that has just become completely polarized along along left, right, or Democratic versus Republican lines. And I just want to emphasize for me the most amazing thing about all of this wasn't so much that there were key facts the government knew that we subsequently discovered. And I, I do, I've obviously, I've become a big inter- critic of The Intercept and I do think they deserve credit there. My hypothesis is that they did that FOIA request with the expectation that it would debunk a lot of the claims about EcoHealth and huh. Peter Daszak and they got this material and it did the opposite and you know, to their credit, they published what they got. <laughs> Good for them, but it was the most valuable contribution to understanding this. It wasn't just that this information was kept hidden. People were banned by big tech policy from questioning Fauci's narrative about the origins of the COVID pandemic until the Biden administration itself came out and said, you know what, we also are uncertain about this and we're gonna investigate. And only then did Facebook and then Twitter and Google say, we're now gonna permit a discussion of this. It, was, it wasn't just that the government hid information, they prohibited any questioning of it on our primary means of communication. Um, all right, let me ask you, uh, to conclude what I now officially consider to be part one of our interview and our discussion. <laughs> right. um, but I do want to give you this chance to talk about this because it's something you know you and I had the chance to discuss. I then went after our discussion and read a bunch of stuff and found where this is coming from and it is not obscure sites. But as I said, the New York Times, I think the headline of the profile about you that I quoted was something like the doctor shock doctrine or something like that or you know the idea that you were this 
leading ideologue of neoliberal cruelties that you took distressed economies and forced the majority of the population to suffer for the benefit of the elites of those societies and international capital that you are the avatar of neoliberalism and cruel disaster capitalism and the shock doctrine is something so embedded in so many narratives we had an opportunity to talk about why you regard that as a misperception so i don't necessarily want to walk through the whole history just for the sake of time but I do want to give you a chance, since I have trifled with this belief in the past, something I absorbed uncritically, to go ahead and address why you think that's an unfair assessment. It's not just unfair, it's completely silly. Uh, it, it, completely silly. I, I, I wanted to read something that I said in September 1989. In, in the New Yorker uh, in, interview. In inter interview with New Yorker. I don't know if you saw that. I did, yeah. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I said, look, I'm no particular fan of Milton Friedman's or Margaret Thatcher's or Ronald Reagan's version of the free market. In the United States terms, I'd be identified as a liberal Democrat. And the country I admire the most is Sweden. OK, this is I, I was a social Democrat from being from a kid, a social Democrat. So this whole idea of now. I was trying the main thing I was trying to do and succeeded in doing with Poland and completely failed with Russia was to try to get some financial help to a country in crisis. Because as we discussed, I had imbibed what I really regard as a wonderful and, and correct view. And I practiced it in my career successfully, a view of John Maynard Keynes in 1919 and the economic consequences of the peace, where he basically says, be nice to the country that's in distress, because otherwise you can really get harm. And of course, Keynes wrote that book in protest of the Versailles Treaty and said the way that the Versailles Treaty is going to squeeze Germany is going to lead to the rise of horrors in the next generation unless we do something different very prophetic, and I took it very uh, deeply. And that's why even in my first outing as an economic advisor, my main pitch was cancel Bolivia's debts because it's in hyperinflation. Stop squeezing this impoverished country. That's how I came to be an advisor to Poland because they looked, said, oh, can you help us with our debts? And I said, absolutely, I can. And I said to the White House, cancel Poland's debts. And lo and behold, they said, yes, absolutely. And I thought, God, I'm really so clever. You know, they, they follow just uh, just what I said. And then on to Russia. And then, and then on to Russia. And I said, OK, we see how it works. Cancel Russia's debts. Hell no. Are you crazy? And so I didn't understand. I said, I gave good advice. I showed, you know, you stabilize, you uh, restore economic growth, you get... But with Russia, nothing that I said was accepted. It had nothing to do with shock this and private. I wasn't even part of that stuff. I was trying to mobilize a debt standstill, which means you stop paying because you ran out of money, and permanent relief and an emergency ruble stabilization fund and finance for uh, even I think in that New York Times article for healthcare, that's where I was spending my time on. We got to make sure the clinics are functioning. The, the, so everything that was said afterwards is so weird. But, you know, one that pinned it on me was uh, actually the Clinton administration, which did nothing. And then Strobe Talbot, in his clever line, said, too much shock, no therapy. And you know what? God damn it. He gave no therapy. He was in the government. I was pounding them, do some therapy, help. And they were doing absolutely nothing. And by the way, I, you know, I just uh, printed out in November 1991. This is before there's independent Russia. I said, now the Cold War and the collapse of communism have left Russia as a prostrate, frightened and unstable, as was Germany, after World War I and World War II. Inside Russia, Western aid would have the galvanizing psychological and political effect that the Marshall Plan had for Western Europe. 
Russia's psyche has been tormented by a thousand years of brutal invasions stretching from Genghis Khan to Napoleon and Hitler. I was pressing, that was my job, was to try to help get some relief. And this got weirdly conflated with all sorts of things, but the opposite of what I believed, completely the opposite. And I quit early on, as I told you, uh, in the end of 1993, because I was having no benefit from, I could not get the United States to do anything. Neither the Bush administration nor the Clinton administration, they were, because already the neocons were in full sway, but I had no idea. And I wanted a weak Russia, and wanted a weak cripple and, Russia to expand let, further. Let me read yeah. What, Go ahead. Yeah, let me read you what I wrote in uh, 2014 in BBC. Uh, NATO's continued desire expressed again just recently to add Ukraine to its membership, thereby putting NATO right up on the Russian border, must be regarded as profoundly unwise and provocative. And then I said, in 1914, 1989, 2014, we live in the spread of NATO and by U.S. bullying since 1991. Come on, this has been my position all along. You help a country in distress or you face consequences, but this country became nastier and nastier in its politics because our domestic political system went completely plutocratic and our foreign policy went completely hegemonic. And this is a disaster for us. This is where we are today. We have a plutocracy at home and we have a wannabe uh, hegemonic rule abroad. Of course, it's so anachronistic, the whole world, other than uh, a small part of the world, which is uh, the European Union, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, and Singapore. Those are the only ones on our side. All the rest of the world is saying, stop, we don't want a hegemon. We want normal cooperation. But we've lost it in this country because the politics are so damn corrupt at home, all driven by money, including the military industrial complex, which is a major lobby pushing for NATO enlargement, NATO weaponry, everything. And then abroad, the Newland administration, foreign policy, right, right. which is expand, expand everywhere and overthrow governments that don't like where you want to expand. It is it is remarkable just how these poli the continuity of these policies while we keep hearing these elections are the most important in our lifetime the parties are so radically different they can't agree on anything and yet there is this remarkable continuity and that's the first thing I observed when I started writing about the Bush and Cheney administration and I was moved by President Obama's passionate vow to uproot it all and then I watched him not only uproot none of it but expand and enlarge virtually all of it and that was my my sort of coming of age lesson. Um, um, I really want to thank yeah, you. This I, I was, could just tell you, I could yeah. tell you, Glenn, uh, in, uh, <laughs> my wife and I love a, a biography, a documentary of Gore Vidal uh, that was uh, filmed uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, and he's sitting in his villa in, in Italy, Italy uh, on, on the night of Obama's election. And they announce on the screen Obama's won. And the cameras go up to Gore Vidal. Aren't you excited? And he's completely, no, I'm not excited. Why aren't you excited? He says, because by the time you've gotten to be president, you've sold your soul so many times, it makes no difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, he was somebody who, you know, used to be enamored of Democratic Party politics, a friend of the Kennedys and the like, and then he finally saw um, enough, and he became a super interesting figure by the end of his life. Um, Again, thank you so much. This was definitely as enlightening as I expected and knew it would be. I'm very much looking forward to at least part two, and we'll see how much uh, we get through the other questions I had and the topics I wanted to discuss. But I really appreciate your time, and I hope to see you again shortly. Hey, phenomenal. I'm going to hold you to part two because it's a lot of fun, and I'm learning a lot from you, so it's, it's great. Thanks. Mutually. Thanks thank you so much. Have a great evening. Great. Bye-bye. Thank you. So that concludes our show for